Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have lots of stuff to get through in today's video. I want to start things out, though, with an update for the performance we can expect for AMD's upcoming Zen 3 architecture, which will find its way to Ryzen 4000, along with other products such as Fred Ripper and, uh, of course, uh, service CPUs later on too. For Ryzen 4000, AMD are pinky swearing that we will still see these products launch by the end of the year. And Ryzen 4000, at least according to what I'm hearing, is still going to have a similar configuration in terms of the number of CPU cores. But, of course, we have a more advanced architecture. Zen 3 will bring a slightly higher clock frequency, at least according to all the info that I'm hearing. But... The actual IPC is where the bulk of the performance gains are going to lie. One of my sources had told me that uh, 15 to 17% was very likely for the average IPC of uh, AMD's uh, Zen 3 architecture, and several other sources had also told me 10 plus percent was bare minimum, and one of my sources had also told me a 50% uh, FP performance too, which honestly I was a little skeptical about, but that's what I was told and that's what I reported. And of course, I had also told you guys to take that specifically with a lot of salt. But interestingly, Jim at, over at Adore TV has also heard the 15-ish percent IPC gain for Zen 3, although according to what he's hearing, it's only going to be for integer performance, with floating point performance being a little lower, around 10% on average. Now, of course, this will mean that different workloads are going to scale rather differently. So, for example, uh, just for the consumer side of things, not looking at server for a moment, a game, for example, will, even on different... Uh, multiple times a second, let alone uh, different games themselves will adjust workloads. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out for game uh, performance jumps. But according to him as well, for the server parts anyway, um, if only one of the CPU cores or a couple of the threads anyway is being loaded, it could mean about a 20% gain for uh, integer performance. However, just given the fact that the CPUs themselves, as more CPU cores are uh, being loaded up, will start lowering in clock frequency, the actual performance may only be about a 15%, 16% gain over what we saw, once again, in uh, integer performance over Zen 2 and Rome. I think this does make sense. I did hear, uh, and I once again did report this, that uh, the clock frequencies of Zen 3 are only around 100 to 200 megahertz, although I have to say that that was a little bit of an older engineering sample, so it's possible they are doing a little bit better now. But honestly, I don't think that we're going to see like, you know, 5.2 gigahertz or cores or anything like that like you can with uh, some of Intel's processors. But that obviously is just the nature of how the Zen processor architecture functions. And I don't think it's going to need it. I think that there is going to be a significant performance uplift for AMD's next gen. It's also going to be really interesting to me for games because of the difference in their cache system. As you are probably aware, AMD have opted to go for a unified cache architecture for Zen 3, which is going to have some significant benefits, I think, for games' performance. I think games actually may, ironically, scale better, perhaps, than a lot of workloads, uh, because many games also don't exactly have, like, 500 threads that they're hitting. Yes, I am being uh, hyperbolic there. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to me for the next gen, especially given the release timings. I think the end of this year is going to be really fascinating. We've not only got Ampere or RTX 30, but RDNA uh, 2 coming out. But on CPUs, there's apparently Intel's Rocket Lake and AMD's Zen 3, plus also the next gen consoles and loads of other stuff as well. So I think the next couple of years are going to be really interesting in tech, but this next six months or so is going to be absolutely crazy with product launches. And while we're on the subject of CPUs, I'd also like to go over a quick update for Intel's Alder Lake, which is obviously on the LGA 1700 socket and will serve as a successor to Rocket Lake. We're expecting it mm, probably late 2021, possibly 
even 2022. It's very difficult to be absolutely certain, but the rumor has it it's also going to be DDR5, which is another reason that I'm expecting it to be a little bit later, simply because of what we're hearing about the release schedule for DDR5 for the mainstream. Anyway, getting back to the actual information that we're hearing, Shark Bay, who is a well-known uh, leaker of stuff, has posted that Order Lake S will have two very, well, let's just say different configurations. Um, from what he's saying, the highest end SKUs will probably have an 8 plus 8 configuration, as you are likely aware at this point. Order Lake is going to use a big little config, which is, well, not without question. For quite frankly, we don't really know how it's going to function in terms of how workloads are going to be split over the big slash little cores. And it's going to be really interesting to see how Windows is even able to handle that, quite honestly. I especially am curious to see if workloads can scale across all of those cores, let's say games, for example, or something that doesn't use one of the instructions, which apparently is absent from the smaller core. I honestly wouldn't be surprised either way um, whether this is or is not possible. But regarding the uh, things we're hearing, the highest end SKU is going to be an 8 plus 8 configuration, but the actual um, lower end SKUs apparently are only going to have the uh, big cores and only six of them as well. But they've not stated how all of these SKUs are kind of divvied up. So, for example, the 8 plus 8 configuration is probably going to be for an i9, but what about this 6 plus 0 config? Is it going to be for, like, an i5? Is it going to be for an i3? Who the hell knows? There's also Older Lake P, which was kind of mysterious. We heard about this. I believe it was Kamachi who first discovered Alder Lake P. I may be wrong and crediting the wrong individual. Looks like it's for essentially replacing the Atom server lineup and it's going to be a little different because it only has a couple of big cores and the majority of the CPU cores are instead little. So for example, a 2 plus 8 configuration. Alder Lake, in terms of the architecture, is really impressive. Allegedly, Alder Lake will be based on um, Golden Cove, which does look like it's got a rather significant IPC gain over what we are expecting with even Intel's Tiger Lake. The thing is, though, Intel will still be significantly behind in terms of the thread count, you would imagine, from what AMD are offering at the time, especially with this big slash little configuration. Although, once again, because we don't know how much work the little cores are going to be putting in, it's kind of difficult to really have an exact performance metric of how Intel's Alder Lake is going to measure up. It's also, well, kind of a big deal because... Zen 4, you can expect to be roughly at the same time schedule as what Intel launches uh, Alder Lake. Obviously, uh, AMD could be a little behind or a little in front of schedule, but Zen 4 should theoretically be available at that point, and you can expect AMD to continue to put tons of pressure on Intel. Does that mean that I don't think Intel can compete with AMD? Well, I don't think it's impossible for Intel to score wins against AMD, especially when it comes to gaming. But with the big slash little configuration, it's going to be interesting how the next couple of years in the desktop roadmap anyway pan out. And now we're going to mosey over to the Xbox Series X as there has been a lot of announcements actually from Microsoft over the past couple of days. For one, the Xbox Series X will be compatible with all Xbox One games with the uh, unfortunate, um, possibly, okay, maybe not unfortunate, exception of Connect titles. This was confirmed on a blog post from Microsoft themselves. Honestly, I don't really care about the non-Connect uh, backwards compatibility. Um, I think that that's like the least, uh, <laughs> least important backwards compatibility ever. So I'm, I'm actually okay with that. Microsoft have also chosen to give us yet further insight into what we can expect for the Xbox Games Showcase, which of course will be the 23rd of July 
9am PT. According to Aaron Greenberg, the event will purely be games. There will not be any business-related announcements. There will be no device announcements. I find that rather interesting, the fact he's saying devices. It's almost like he's acknowledging that we know about Lockhart. It's almost like he knows that we know, but he can't acknowledge that we know because they're not talking about it in the game showcase. So we know that it exists. He knows that it exists, but he's going to wait for us um, to have another event uh, that we have to attend, and then they'll announce that it exists. Hopefully that made sense to someone. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, that's how I'm interpreting this, that he's basically acknowledging that Lockhart exists. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But anyway, awesome the news, just games. It's going to be about an hour's long. And in a blog post, they've stated that it will be 1080p 60fps live stream, but there will be also 4K 60fps VOD demands afterwards. I'm actually okay with that. I don't really feel that it needs a 4K live stream, honestly. As long as you've got the VODs afterwards, I'm okay with it. Um, I'm interested to see how many of you will be streaming from Facebook or Twitter. I think the majority of folks are just going to stream from YouTube or Twitch, but whatever, maybe I'm wrong. It will also be, of course, hosted by Jeff Knightley, and there will also be a YouTube pre-show. There will also be live language support for various countries, including Japan, Korea... Germany, Russia, Arabic, whatever you want to listen to it in, you can do so. But uh, primarily this event, I think, is going to really set the tone for what we are expecting for Xbox. Microsoft have also confirmed that we will see some campaign gameplay of Halo Infinite, which is something I discussed I'd been hearing would be the case a couple of days ago. So it's nice to see that we're getting this confirmed by Microsoft themselves. After Sony kind of gave us some idea of what they've been working on, and I'll reiterate that certainly not all of the games that the, uh, Sony have been working on. Um, I think it's good that we finally have a decent understanding now about the Xbox. I don't know if they're going to reveal everything. I think there's still a good chance that Microsoft are going to have a couple of cards uh, up their sleeves. And obviously... Given the, they're not going to be uh, providing a pricing information or any of that stuff, um, and the rumour is, by the way, that that's going to be in August, possibly later. I think it's going to be August. I think September could be a bit late, to be honest, for us to kind of get pricing information. Maybe I'm wrong. But let's say it's in August or a future date. I think it makes sense for Microsoft to hold on one to two announcements for the future so that we get, let's say, a Lockhart announcement but with another game. I think that does make some sense. Whether they're going to hold back something like Fable or Perfect Dark, which are a couple of the games that there's rumoured to be worked on, I don't know. I'm hoping that we see uh, a really good blowout, though, from Microsoft. I'm, I'm really excited to see what the next generation for both companies is going to bring for us. The only issue is certain games did have um, Connect kind of uh, functionality, uh, for example, uh, Rise, Son of Rome, I believe, was one of those games. But you could still do everything via the controller anyway. And um, I honestly am totally okay with Connect just disappearing, to be honest. Also, according to Director of Program Management, Jason Ronald, over at Microsoft, next-gen game sizes may not be as massive as perhaps some folks had feared. And this is through a combination of different reasons, at least according to his interview with IGN, not least of which is that game installs aren't going to be so ridiculous in terms of all the data that they throw on to your drive. For example, if you're an English-speaking individual, you won't need to worry about, let's say, Spanish and tons of other voice languages being installed. That isn't to say that you may not choose to install them. I know some people, for example, may want to play a game in Japanese, especially if that is how it was originally created. Um, so that would certainly be something that uh, is understandable. 
But in general, having all of that additional voice dialogue, of course, takes tons of space on the drive. And I think ultimately, next gen games are going to be a lot better. I've already explained some of this before in an uh, SSD analysis video. But basically, one of the problems with mechanical drives and the reason that sizes balloon up so much is that textures and objects need to be repeated multiple times on a disk. So if you have a level with the same fire hydrant um, as another level, you can't just have one reference to that fire hydrant. It needs to appear multiple times on that level. Uh, sorry, it, within the, the hard drive, every time that you're loading an area with that fire hydrant in it, because otherwise the disk uh, takes time to seek uh, whatever data is on it. So that basically increases the time of uh, loading, which is obviously not great. So I don't think that... Um, I don't think that... Uh, sizes are necessarily going to be drastically larger simply because of just how games are going to be a lot more efficiently uh, compressed as well with the decompression technology on both the playstation 5 and xbox series x it means that you can actually compress the data considerably more compared to the current generation because decompression currently is being handled by the cpu and the cpu in both machines is well kind of weeding so being able to offload that to dedicated decompression technology is definitely a benefit. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. The normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.